Beth, do you have a pun? So it's a little bit of a story. Um, You guys know I like to bake. Uh, I was in the kitchen baking some bread and accidentally spilled some yeast in the soup I was cooking. And I decided I would eat it anyway. Um, It actually tasted pretty good. It was um, soup rising. (laughs) (laughs) It's a pretty bad one, right? They're all bad, Beth. Paul, do you have anything better? I mean, several. So I took my final exam on magic mushrooms. Okay. And I pass with flying colors. (laughs) (laughs) I like that one a lot. And the next one's dark. Um, (laughs) How do you tell a good mushroom from a toxic mushroom? I I don't know. You have a friend try it first? (laughs) (laughs) All right. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto, here with my great friend and America's primary care physician, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. On tonight's show, we're going to be talking about uh, fungi, uh, fungal infections, uh, with a great guest, Dr. Elon Schwartz. And Paul, uh, before we introduce our our wonderful co-host for this episode, uh, will you remind the audience, what is it that we do on the Curbsiders? Yeah, I had a moment of panic where I forgot for a second, but um, it's all coming back to me in that we are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And as you mentioned, we have a great expert. And we also have a, a, a returning favorite, a super producer, co-host, Dr. Extraordinaire, my once and future boss, uh, Dr. Beth Garbatelli. Garbs, how are you? Doing well. So Garbs, did you want to, uh, we, we had a long discussion. Did you want to maybe tease some of the highlights and then let them know about our guest? Yes, we covered so many good things. We reviewed kind of who to be worried about for um, fungal diseases, uh, features of, of candidemia, the initial workup, fungal endocarditis, PJP, Candida auris, the last of us. We, we hit it all. Um, so we spoke with Dr. Elon Schwartz. He's an infectious disease physician at Duke University who specializes in infections in immunocompromised patients. He serves on the board of directors of the Mycoses Study Group Education and Research Consortium, an organization of cl- clinicians that are dedicated to advancing diagnostics and treatment of fungal disease. So without further ado, we will get to our episode. Oh, and before that, I wanted to remind the audience that this and most episodes are available for CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And I would also like to remind the audience, Paul, we're on we're on Patreon now, patreon.com slash curbsiders. What's happening on there, Paul? Oh, gosh, Matt, all kinds of stuff. So <laughs> if you if you would happen to support our show, I mean, we're always going to provide free high quality content with CME and MOC um, to, to broaden your skill set. But if, if you would happen to support us on Patreon, we have bonus episodes where Matt and I will sort of distill down really high yield episodes into their very salient points and then also give our picks of the week. So if you've been missing those, um, feel free to head over to the Patreon and, and you can hear about Matt's new favorite jump rope there. Um, we also have a Discord. I think we have access to exclusive swag. Am I making that up, Matt? Maybe I'm making That's it up true. so we don't even have. So and we also, lots- yeah. Oh, and we're yep, also ahead. answering listener questions on the bonus episodes and on the Discord. We're kind of, you know, there's medical questions being shared, cases run by each other on there. There's, uh, I believe Paul is is very into the music recommendations on there. This is just a great way to, you know, hang out with other people in our community, also support the show. We have all these great producers like Beth. We have a, a whole production team behind the scenes, artists, writers, uh, we have other shows and miniseries that all this helps to fund that so that we can keep doing this work and, uh, you know, hopefully making us all take better care of patients. So thank you to those of you who have supported. It's really taken off. And uh, thank you to our future supporters as well. Yeah, frankly, it gets you more access to me than my family has presently. So whatever that's <laughs> worth, just something to think about. Elon, thank you so much for coming on the show. The audience has heard your bio, but Tell them about a hobby or interest that you have outside of medicine. So I really enjoy traveling with my family. Um, I've been doing it mostly in the context of going to conferences and uh, 
and they always tag along and ex enjoy exploring uh, new cities and, and new places. Um, more recently, I've, I've become a chauffeur. I've uh, <laughs> learned um, what, what it's like to, to schlep your kids to organize sports. My son is playing hockey and, and soccer now, and so I spend a lot of my time doing that. Uh, and, uh, and, and my daughter is about to take up some, some sports as well. So that's, that's what's keeping me busy when I'm not uh, thinking about fungus. Yeah, the multiplier effect of of having kids and you, you have one kid and they do two sports. So you're like, okay, that's a couple nights a week. And then you have two kids and they have multiple things. And, and then it just gets insane very quickly. So uh, best of luck to you. And I, I hope you're a good driver. And so what, what, cause I, I don't know what the ID conferences look like. Do you actually get to get to get the fun cities or I, I'm not here to be smirch any towns. So I'm not going to name names about some of the less exciting conferences I've been <laughs> yeah. to. But what, what's, what's the, well, let's be positive. What's the, your favorite place that you've traveled for work slash fun? Yeah. So in, in the last year, um, I went to <laughs> Denmark for, um, yeah, this is what I'm talking uh, the about. The big, big European conference. Yeah. That's called pretty Ekne. cool. Um, and then we squeezed in a trip to uh, Iceland on the way back because that's just where our, our flight went. We'd always wanted to go to Iceland. And then um, we will be going to Boston in uh, early October for ID Week. And then uh, later in October to a conference called TIM, Trends in Medical Mycology, which is in Athens, Greece. Yeah. That's super cool. I also like yeah. the acronym. <laughs> Tim. <laughs> yeah, so so it's it's cool. It's it's a fun way, you know. Now that that conferences are back in person, it's it's just a great way to reconnect with with colleagues, and uh, it's cool that you know my my family gets to uh, do some some traveling, build up some air miles as well. Paul, are you furious right now that he I'm has been so to mad. Denmark, <laughs> Greece, Iceland, and you and I? Where have we been, Paul? No offense to any of these cities. I'm just saying they're they're all in the U.S. Yeah, I want to go somewhere that I haven't been. <laughs> yeah, agreed. So if any Danish conferences would like a fairly popular medicine podcast, where our <laughs> our emails at the end. All right. Well, let's let's get. We have very ambitious script. Is the way we uh, is the way we're describing this one with uh, how much is packed into this. So let's let's start getting onto some cases so we can start talking, uh, getting to the topic at hand. Awesome. So let's say you've just gotten on service and as per usual, your patient list is very sick because your hospital's ICU is bursting at the seams. Um, when you get sign out from the physician going off service, they mention in passing, maybe think about broadening coverage with an antifungal on that patient in 612. So we left this case stem intentionally very vague because sometimes it seems like this is how fungal coverage gets mentioned and brought up in sign outs and sort of as a contingency. Um, and our question to really kick off the conversation is who should we actually be worried about having invasive fungal infections? Yeah, I, I feel like this is one of those situations where, um, you know, with spiraling empiricism that we see in patients that are sick, we keep adding more things. And then eventually we kind of run out of things to add, we sort of back ourselves into a corner. So, you know, we've already got the meropenem and the vancomycin. Well, we need something else, you know, let's try to think about a, a different kingdom of pathogens. And so let's, you know, throw in a kind of cannon on there. Um, and so, you know, I, I think, I think that the, the premise needs to um, be examined a little bit to see, you know, you know, why, why uh, does my colleague have these concerns and is an antifungal really what's indicated? In terms of the, the types of infections that we would worry about um, that would necessitate empiric antifungal initiation overnight, the most common thing that we see in the hospital is uh, invasive candidiasis. And the reason is because most of our patients, particularly in the ICU, have at least one risk factor for invasive candidiasis. So these are typically uh, medically and surgically complex patients. Uh, risk factors include any type of surgery that transects the gut wall, the, the presence of indwelling central venous catheters, the receipt of broad spectrum antibacterials. Uh, uh, sometimes patients are on TPN as well, which is an additional risk factor. Mucositis, neutropenia. Often patients will have like at least one of these risk factors and, and they um, compound when they occur in multiplicity. And so um, this is typically the situation that, that you're going to encounter when 
thinking about an invasive fungal infection. And so in terms of, you know, which patients overnight might you be worried about, you know, certainly those um, complex surgical patients, you know, somebody with suspected intra-abdominal sepsis who's not improving in spite of very broad spectrum antibacterials, uh, uh, you would think about um, invasive candidiasis. The, the other situation that I want to talk about from the mold category um, that is really going to be important for internists to recognize overnight, and they may not get a warning about this in handover because often it's not really thought about until it's, uh, it's too late, is mucormycosis, particularly in patients with poorly controlled diabetes um, hyperglycemia, and often with, with DKA. And so the classic uh, history is, you know, a patient, sometimes this is their first presentation of DKA, and it's sort of unmasked. They present with, you know, altered uh, mentation and uh, dehydration and all the usual things that, that occur with that, that profound hyperglycemia and, and DKA. But then uh, they don't get better the way that they're supposed to. And if they start to have um, clinical findings of swelling or uh, discoloration or kind of duskiness of the skin over the sinuses or um, in the uh, periorbital region or ulceration or an eschar uh, on the skin or in the mouth. These are all things that are like five uh, uh, alarm for infectious disease physicians and, and, and really should uh, set off alarm bells for uh, anybody looking after these patients as well, because this really is a surgical emergency. So it necessitates not just um, empiric antifungals, and in this case, it, it would be um, liposomal amphotericin B, and we'll talk a bit more about that later, but really it needs um, an emergent surgical consultation. And so usually this is going to be ENT, but also you know imaging and neurosurgery. And these things happen really, really fast um, in the course of, of hours. Uh, and so, you know, it's it's a it's a very extreme situation. Fortunately, it's not very common in in North America. It is it is very common in some parts of the world, like India, for example. We don't see a lot of it, but when it happens, it really is devastating. And so, I do want people to be um, aware of that. And you know, th th those are sort of the the types of infections that I would think about um, in terms of. Uh, people who might need initiation of empiric antifungals overnight. But of course, you know, the list is really a lot longer than that. Um, the, the thing that I want to stress is really to have a low barrier to calling your colleague from infectious diseases, even if it's in the middle of the night, if you're worried about a fungal infection, particularly in someone who's immune compromised, um, you should really have no reservation about, about calling on your colleagues who, who can help you out with these really complex cases. When folks have that have a presentation of mucor, do they have a lot of tenderness on the facial exam and do they have drainage? I mean, what would be sort of the warning signs before they would get to that kind of dusky appearance? Is there anything that like someone should keep an eye out for if they're admitting that person overnight? Yeah. So often by the time it's clinically apparent, it's, you know, that represents uh, a, a large degree of, of necrosis. And, and what we can observe as clinicians is really just the tip of the iceberg what's on the surface. And so, um, you know, certainly any sort of complaints, if you have a patient who, you know, is hyperglycemic, but is still, you know, mentating and is able to convey their symptoms to you, if they're complaining of any sort of tenderness in the sinuses, any, you know, dental issues, loosening of teeth, it, you know, they might have rhinorrhea, um, any sort of visual disturbance that is, you know, accompanied by some focal findings on uh, on examination would all be reasons to you know have a very low threshold to to you know call up e ID call ENT and get uh, get imaging. Usually we have to start with a CT face. Ideally it would be an MRI, but you know sometimes it takes a little bit longer to organize an MRI. But uh, if you can skip to MRI and you have a high index of suspicion, then that's what you should do. Again, while having the the surgeons kind of at the ready. Yeah, so just doing a good, we, we talked about this recently, Paul, in another episode, just doing an actual head and neck exam, you know, looking in the, I guess, the ears, nose, throat uh, would be a good thing to do. And the equipment's not always there, but at least you could shine your phone flashlight or you can find your friendly neighborhood, Paul Williams, who carries uh, carries a kit with them. <laughs> Carried. Yeah, those days are behind me now. I'm, I'm still waiting for another well, you know I mean. medical student to, to prey upon. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, Elon, I, I do want to ask, you know, we're, we're talking sort of about this idea of empiric coverage. So, you know, your colleague handed me the paper. I feel like it was a million years ago since I've done ICU care, but I feel like the patient where you think about this would be like the one who's just kind of not getting better, even though they 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 seem sickish. It looks kind of infectious. You have one broad spectrum antibiotics. The numbers aren't going in the right direction. And then it's usually there's nothing focal discussed. It's more like, eh, seems like okay, we should probably do sort of broadened coverage, I guess. And then sort of like tag, you're it. I'm going home. Bye. Don't call. Um, so I guess my question is, who is the appropriate patient to start empiric treatment? And then the second part of the question is, and if you're not starting empiric treatment, then what what additional tests that we haven't done already should be doing to see if that's the right thing to do? You know, there's, there's not going to be a lot of, of tests that are going to come back in the middle of the night. Um, if we're talking about, you know, you're, you're covering the night shifts. But uh, certainly, if you're worried about invasive candidiasis, you should be getting blood cultures. If you're worried about, you know, invasive uh, mold infection, and, and th this type of situation would be, you know, typically an immune compromised patient, um, a hematologic malignancy, a um, solid organ transplant or a stem cell transplant, someone with one, one of these, you know, profound immunodeficiencies who has a, a persistent fever, has, you know, some hypoxia. And, and so you overnight, you do a, a CT of the chest, or, or maybe your colleague ordered a CT of the chest, and now it's, you know, resulted and, and, uh, and there's some nodules and um, you get a call from radiology saying, you know what, um, I'm concerned about, about uh, a fungal infection on the basis of, of this picture. That would be someone that you would want to start um, empiric antifungal therapy as well. And so in this case, you know, that, that's a little bit different because typically for um, invasive candidiasis, you're going to start in a kind of candid, and that's the first line of therapy um, for uh, patients in whom you suspect invasive candidiasis in, with most forms of the disease. And there are some exceptions to that. Um, but if you are worried about a mold infection like aspergillosis, which is the by far the most common mold infection in uh, in North America, then we would start either liposomal avatericin B, if you're not sure, you know, if you think that this patient may have risk factors for um, a less common, but, but, you know, more resistant mold like mucorales, or, you know, typically it would be a mold active azole. And so this is a uh, either voriconazole or more frequently in the U.S., what I'm seeing is people using posiconazole or sometimes isabuconazole. And so those are all antifungals in the azole family that have mold activity, which is in contradistinction to fluconazole, which really only has um, very limited activity. It, it's active against yeasts. It has some mold activity like, like um, uh, dermatophytes, but not in terms of true invasive mold infections. Going back to the testing that we might order for these patients, you know, what's your go-to range of testing and what are the limitations? I mean, the, my, the ones I think about are the aspergillus antigen, um, the beta D-glucan, um, and then trying to get, some, you know, some sort of sputum if there's a respiratory component with a silver stain. In, in general, there are sort of direct uh, microbiological tests where we, you know, grow the, the organism or we... Um, we detect it using PCR. Um, and then there's these indirect ones where we measure biomarkers. And in terms of, of culture, so regular aerobic blood cultures will detect candida um, in, in, in most cases. Uh, although, you know, with intra-abdominal candidiasis, we probably miss about 50% with blood culture alone. So, you know, the sensitivity is not, is not great, but it's not much better with, um, with, uh, fungal blood culture. So what fungal blood cultures are is they use centrifugation and, uh, and lysis. So it's a special bottle that goes into a special machine that kind of vortexes it down to, to lice open those, those cells, the macrophages and the white blood cells and, uh, in order to to improve the yield of intracellular organisms, and so most fungi uh, that we think about in in the hospital anyway, you know, are extracellular in addition to intracellular, and so you, we don't need those fungal blood cultures. So uh, so uh, Canada and you know Fusarium, sometimes Aspergillus, um, can can show up on blood culture as well. So the fungal blood cultures we really only use if we're worried about intracellular organisms like histoplasma, TB. Uh, it's the same 
blood culture system that uh, cracks open, you know, the the macrophages in order to get those intracellular um, AFBs. And and so it, it would just be in 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 those particular contexts with those um, biomarkers that I mentioned. There's sort of two two main ones that that we use, and both of them detect various sugars on the cell wall of fungi. And so uh, the first one is beta D glucan, and uh, beta D glucan is a, a component. You know, it's a, a, a polysaccharide on the, on the cell wall of most clinically relevant fungi, but not all of them. Uh, so notable blind spots are, you know, some of the dimorphic fungi, mucorales, uh, for, for example. Th- th- those are the, the main ones that I can think of at this moment, cryptococcus um, as well. On the other hand, it, it would detect, you know, candidiasis, pneumocystis, and then a range of other fungi. So it is, um, it's quite sensitive. The problem is that it is nonspecific. There's a lot of things that can cause positive results. Um, there's, you know, other fungi that can cause positive results, but more importantly, there's other things that are not clinically relevant fungal infections. So, you know, for example, ECMO circuits, uh, dialysis uh, filtration, you know, in, in the past there was concern with, with some antibiotics, that's less of a concern now. Um, it basically, any anything that causes you know transient translocation of of fungi in addition to other things from the gut. So, you know, when you have a, a patient who's got sepsis and they've got kind of a leaky gut uh, syndrome, that can result in you know clinically insignificant uh, translocation. So, you know, it's it's clinically significant that it's a marker that this patient is really unwell, but it's not necessarily that, you know, the fungi that translocate in those events are, are setting up shop and mm. causing disease. And, and so those patients don't necessarily need antifungals, but they may flag positive. So beta glucan is, is nonspecific. Um, and so for this, the second test is aspergillus galactomannan. Galactomannan is, is also a, a, a sugar on the cell wall, um, primarily of aspergillus, but it's shared with a lot of other fungi as well, including fusarium, histoplasma, um, and others. It can be detected in the serum in patients with invasive aspergillosis. Um, particularly, that is helpful in the context of patients with really profound immunodeficiencies like AML or, or other hematologic um, malignancies. It's not as helpful in patients with solid organ transplants, for example, or um, you know, COPD on steroids, other patients that you might be worried about invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. But a, a negative result would be a little bit more reassuring in a patient with a, a hematologic malignancy. You know, in general, all of these tests, you, you need to have an understanding of the pretest probability in the patient in front of you. And then you also have to have an understanding of the operating characteristics in that particular patient type. So, you know, the beta glucan and galactomannan don't perform equally well in a patient with, you know, AML as they do in a, in a patient who's, you know, in the ICU with intra-abdominal sepsis um, versus a, a patient with a, a solid organ transplant. So, you know, all, all, all of which uh, is to say that um, we need to be mindful of, of how we're ordering these tests because, you know, wh- whether the results are going to influence our management, whether we're going to be reassured enough to stop um, antifungals if they're negative. And typically, typically we're not with uh, galactomannan in particular, beta D glucan sometimes, um, or, or conversely, whether a positive test is going to uh, cause us to, to order a result or order uh, um, an antifungal. So let me... Let me do a little bit of recap what we talked about so far, and then we can go on to the, I think, the second part of the case. So we talked about uh, if you're seeing a patient overnight and, uh, you know, you're worried about could this be an invasive fungal infection that needs more coverage, uh, certainly invasive candidiasis could be one of the ones that we would maybe more commonly commonly see, uh, especially sicker patients, complex medical surgical histories that are uh, sick in the ICU. And in those cases, we reaching for an echinocandin as a first, first line medication. You talked about, uh, mucormycosis 
is a mucor is a mold that in patients, even a patient with diabetes and DKA, if they're having some really crazy sinus uh, tenderness, facial edema, discoloration, eschars, like that, that could be a sign of that. And uh, for molds, we're going to be using amphotericin B, and that's like a major emergency. Those patients, depending on where they're at, might need surgical intervention too for mucor. And uh, you talked about aspergillosis also being a, a mold that would, we would use amphotericin B as a first line. And then there's some mold active azoles like boriconazole or posiconazole, which might also be uh, in play if you know you're dealing with aspergillosis. And talking about the tests, uh, fungal blood cultures, often not necessary. Um, they do this fancy, they lyse the macrophages so we can try to figure out what's inside there. And, uh, but, but we don't always need those regular blood cultures could pick up candida. We talked about that, uh, with fungal testing, we have direct, uh, testing like cultures and PCR. And we just talked about the two common indirect, uh, tests or biomarkers. So that was beta D glucan, um, which covers most fun fungi, but has some gaps. You said mucoralis, um, and some of the dimorphic fungi and maybe crypto cryptococcus as well. And then uh, galactomannan um, is found on aspergillus and uh, some other ones like histo and uh, fu you said fusarium. And that's kind of where we were at. And we were, we were just saying that you really need to know your pre-test pre probabilities um, when you're ordering, especially some of these indirect biomarkers. Otherwise, you can end up uh, in a confusing situation. Paul, we've, we were talking about like ANAs recently. This reminds me of that sort of thing where you can order a test and not know what to do with the results. So any, uh, any modifications of, of anything I said there, I don't want to misquote you and just but, but make sure, but we, we kind of have talked about a lot already. So I just wanted to try a little bit of a recap at least. Yeah, no, that sounds right. Okay. All right, Beth. So you wanted to, you go on to the next part of the case. Okay. And now onto our next case. George is a 32 year old male with a history of tobacco use disorder anemia, mitral valve prolapse. He was hospitalized approximately a year ago with mitral valve endocarditis and successfully completed um, a complete course of appropriate IV antibiotics. Um, he presents to CASHLAC now with worsening fatigue, shortness of breath, and cough. Admission labs are notable for having a leukopenia to 1.7, uh, hemoglobin 7.6, and platelets of 90. Three days into hospitalization, his blood cultures that were obtained on admission grow yeast in two out of two cultures. So I guess my question kind of is, you know, we have a patient like this presenting with fungemia. What are the things that you want to do in that initial workup? Um, how quick do you need that ophtho consult? I know that's a little bit of a controversial question sometimes. Yeah, so, you know, as, as I mentioned, the patients at, at risk of candidemia include a, a wide number of, of risk factors, including having indwelling central venous catheters, being on broad spectrum antibiotics, you know, the receipt of, of steroids, neutropenia, mucositis, um, any surgery that transects the gut wall. Injection drug users have a, a high rate of, uh, of candida um, endocarditis as well and, and candida bloodstream infections. You know, m most of, of those risk factors that I mentioned are not you know, kind of classic causes of um, immunodeficiency, you know, neutropenia accepted, but most patients with candidiasis are not neutropenic. You don't necessarily need to go, you know, searching for an immune compromising condition. Now, with that said, should you test this patient for HIV? Absolutely. You should test every patient who, you know, comes to the hospital um, or arguably through your outpatient um, practice for, for HIV. You know the the clinical picture here is is more in keeping with with candidiasis, but again there are a number of other um, less common yeasts as well that can can cause very similar uh, and overlapping uh, clinical syndrome. You know if you if you have a patient you've, you've um, you determined that they they have a yeast in their in their bloodstream, so the first thing is to determine you know what type of yeast is this a patient that has risk factors for um, cryptococcosis. So typically that would be a patient with cirrhosis or an immunodeficiency like advanced HIV or 
you know, transplant or, or um, another, you know, overt underlying immunodeficiency. If you have candidiasis, you're going to, first of all, try to establish the, the uh, persistence of, uh, of that uh, bloodstream infection. So you're going to check additional uh, blood cultures and you're going to repeat them, you know, at least every other day. Uh, if not every day, until uh, demonstrated negative. In this case, George's blood cultures were not positive until three days in, and that's you know that's not uncommon with with Canada infections. It's not like a, you know a, a gram negative bacteremia where you get the results back. They're you know growing the organism within twelve hours. Sometimes you have to wait three days or five days uh, before before those results are, are positive. And so in the me- in the interim, you want to be collecting culture so you can establish a pattern. How long are they candidemic? Because that'll give you an idea of whether you need to look for a persistent nidus um, of infection. It's not uncommon that patients remain candidemic for, for several days. And, you know, the most common nidus that, that we see are, are um, indwelling central penis catheters. And so um, those would need to be removed. That would be you know, one of the, the first steps. You, ideally, you would want to uh, prove that they're no longer candidemic before putting in a, a, another uh, long-term indwelling mm-hmm. um, catheter. Although, you know, in the in the short term, you can certainly use a, a peripheral. You probably would want to do an echocardiogram in, in a patient like George, who's got a history of endocarditis. You, you do want to get a... Um, ophthalmologic uh, consultation. As you said, there, there is some controversy there. The um, ophthalmologists aren't particularly happy with this recommendation <laughs> from the IDSA. Is that the main controversy? It's just hard to get them in. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. They, they don't like, they don't like coming into the hospital. That, um, that seems relatively self-serving that they don't, they don't want, they don't want us to call them. I, yeah, I feel like that's, that's what that is. That's a very selfish recommendation. Yeah, or they'll 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 ask you to send the patient over to their clinic, you know, across town, and it's like, well, you know, the patient is kind of sick, so maybe you should come here. To but, our and- ophthalmology <laughs> colleagues listening, we're just we're just joking. We love you, and we can't do what you do. That's why we that's why we're desperate for your help. Totally, maybe maybe Paul. It sounds like Paul's got like a whole kit. <laughs> Paul does. Just walk right. around yeah. in the Paul can do the eye exam. Right? Just, just Paul call has Paul. a portable slit lamp that he carries around with him. How yeah. hard can it be? Yeah, just <laughs> probably dry eyes. I mean, what's <laughs> so the you know the patients in, in whom I would say for sure you know that and the ophthalmologists would agree need a, an ophthalmology exam are, are patients that have uh, symptoms, uh, you know, visual changes or or clinical exam findings mm-hmm. of, uh, of endophthalmitis, where, you know, there's less agreement is in patients who are unable to verbalize, you know, maybe because they're in the ICU um, and aren't able to report whether they've got any visual symptoms. And so mm-hmm. certainly the IDSA guidelines would recommend that those patients do have an ophthalmologic exam. And then um, a gray area is those patients that are, you know, copus mentis, can report to you if they have visual uh, changes, but they uh, they don't have any visual changes. I feel less strongly about those patients, but you know certainly the guidelines do recommend that they, uh, as a matter of routine, should have an ophthalmologic exam. But again, you know those are the ones that you're going to get the pushback from from the the ophthalmologists. the The issue is that the treatment is different if they do have endophthalmitis. The treatment is longer, so typically for three weeks instead of 14 days. And because the antifungals don't penetrate very well into the vitreous, then they also need a vitrectomy where they will, you know, put a needle into the, the eyeball for lack of a better word. Um, you That's remove some of the, the, the <laughs> remove some of the, uh, the vitriol fluid and then inject some, uh, voriconazole or, uh, another antifungal in, into the space. So, um, you know, and that, and that can be a, a, a site preserving intervention. And so it's, you know, it's important that we identify which patients do in, in de- indeed have uh, endophthalmitis. The timing is dependent on the host. So it should be within seven days of diagnosis of candidemia, except in patients who are neutropenic. And in those patients, it should be within seven days of neutrophil recovery. And the reason is because you do not see the same kind of inflammatory findings in the absence of, of neutrophils. And so the, the, the yield of that examination is going to be higher. 
once they have uh, neutrophilic recovery. So Beth, let's get on to the next part. You want to give us a little more about George? Yeah. Um, I think we actually kind of covered, we, the next part of the case was that unfortunately he has fungal endocarditis, you know, the, the veg on his valve is bigger. Um, he's still having positive cultures. And I guess the, the main question is like, what are the treatments? Do folks like this definitely need surgical intervention? Um, and then are there certain types of fungus that are, or candida that are more virulent, more concerning? So the management of um, fungal endocarditis is, is very challenging. Um, you know, fortunately, these comprise a small proportion of cases of endocarditis, only about three to five percent. Um, but they're, you know, they're really tough to, to manage, um, especially without surgery. So uh, for sure, these patients should have a, a consultation with a, a, cardio, um, a cardiovascular surgeon. Um, and, you know, depending on um, the degree of, of valvular dysfunction, the, the duration of, of fungemia, the, the presence of, you know, prosthetic material and other comorbidities, you know, there'll be a, a, a strong case for, uh, for considering a, a valvular surgery. Um, often the, the lesions of uh, Canada endocarditis are really, really big. They're a lot bigger than in other um, forms of, of uh, infectious endocarditis. And so often, you know, just on the basis of, of size, um, they often do need, you know, some type of valvular posse, but, you know, whether that can be done without valve replacement or not, you know, I'd have to defer that to our, our cardiovascular surgeons. The medical treatment is uh, basically antifungals for a very, very long time, you know, typically in a kind of candon, uh, which, which gets good biofilm penetration. Although in many cases, you're eventually going to switch to an azole because, you know, kind of candons are, are, only IV. That's mostly true. Recently, there was a, a kind of candidate like um, antifungal that was uh, approved in, in the U.S. It's currently only approved for vulvovaginal candidiasis. It's called Ibrexafungerp. <laughs> That's I, I, a terrible name. <laughs> I, did not, I did not make that up. Don't worry, uh, Paul. The brand name will be nice and snappy. Farmer will see to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. the, yeah, so so the so the brand name ensures that you're not going to use this medication for for <laughs> endocarditis. It's called Brexafem, so you're not going to oh, use Brexafem. Sure. Yeah, that for, is worse <laughs> for for your endocarditis. It's it's not it's not appro approved for it, and it's not dosed for it. It's dosed for for uh, for vulvovaginal candidiasis. So, um, you know, so I know that I know that true ID nerds are are going to say, well, actually, when I say that echinocannons are only uh, parenteral, but you know, by, uh, by and large, they are. There, there was also recently uh, another kind of canon that was approved that might be uh, helpful in, in in these patients that require very long courses, and that is called resifungin. And it's um, what makes it different is that instead of daily administration, it's weekly administration. But it, of course, it costs an arm and a leg, and so um, it would be yeah. you know hard to justify it in in most patients. Uh, even outpatients. These patients are often, you know, getting into new heart failure and then you're giving them all these fluids. So it would be nice if there is the resifungin, um an oral option. Oh, no, yours. It's an IV like once a the, week. Yeah, that's a, a weekly IV. I feel yeah. like the IV antibiotics haven't taken off. Isn't there an IV, a vancomycin version that's like a once a week anti yeah, antibiotic? Yeah, del like delbavancin. Yeah. So, no, it, I mean, it hasn't taken off. Because it's you know it's exorbitantly expensive, um, and you know there's there's a lot of situations we're increasingly um, appreciating the value of of oral therapy for even mm -hmm. very you know serious infections, and so um, you know the first the first thing is okay, well you know do we really need that more expensive once a week option, or can we get away with the the daily option, and then the next. Um, the next question is, well, actually, do we need an IV option at all, or can we can we use an oral option? So fluconazole, right. for example, is is an oral, you know, it is also administered IV, um, but it 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 is an, an oral medication and it has excellent uh, bioavailability. And so uh, even in, in patients with candidemia, you can treat them with oral um, mm -hmm. fluconazole. So obviously, this is you know the type of situation that you're you're going to want your ID colleagues to be involved. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and it, is, it is rare, but it is unfortunately getting more common to have candidemia. Um, I think the threat of like fungal things, invasive fungal infections has really been in the mind of pop culture as well with, you know, the TV show, The Last of Us, uh, based on the video game. Um, and, you know, to be more serious, like reading some of the articles about Candida auris, uh, they're low key terrifying. So I, I'm, I'm a little curious what your thoughts are on that, like the threats of these growing um, resistant fungal organisms. Yeah, so in, in terms of virulence, um, you know, the, the king is old fashioned Canada albicans. You know, there's a reason that Canada albicans comprises 90% in some um, regions, uh, cases of, of, um, of invasive candidiasis with, you know, the other uh, 10 to, you know, maybe 20% made up of, of uh, less common uh, Canada species. With that said, you know, there are other ones that are more difficult or more challenging to manage because Canada albicans, you know, is typically susceptible to, to fluconazole. Canada cruzii, for example, is a, a, a very difficult one that we see almost exclusively in the context of patients who are on, on prophylaxis. So um, often these are, are hematologic, oncologic patients that are on fluconazole prophylaxis and then develop a breakthrough with with uh, Canada cruzii. And, and, and this just, you know, leads into the sort of whack-a-mole occurrence or phenomenon in uh, uh, selecting resistant organisms with, uh, with, with prophylactic therapy. Canada um, cruzii is challenging because it's universally resistant to fluconazole. Sometimes it can be susceptible to other azoles like voriconazole or postcol or isaviconazole, um, but it's, uh, it's a challenge to, to manage. Glabrata is another one that we're seeing increasing resistance. Um, we also sometimes see resistance to echinocandins with, with glabrata, um, although fortunately, you know, that, that the rate of resistance has not continued to rise in, in accordance to you know, what some early studies had predicted. Canada auris is, is a different beast altogether. It is different from the all the other Canada uh, that I mentioned for a few reasons. The first is that, you know, Canada albicans, Canada glabrata, cruzii, all of these ones, they they are commensals of the, the human GI tract. And so they're typically you know, organisms that the patient brings with them into the hospital. And so while they do have hospital onset fungemia or candidemia, um, it's not something that they acquired in the hospital, you know, exogenously. On the other hand, Canada auris is a commensal of the skin. Um, and so the, the difference is that there's then a lot more opportunities for contamination of the environment, of the patient's environment, you know, their, their hospital bed, the bed rails, other, other um, touch points in, in the patient's room. The second thing is that it's very good at forming biofilms. Uh, Canada albicans is also very good at forming biofilms. And so that's why um, we, you know, absolutely need central venous catheters to be removed um, for, for candidemia because those biofilms are, are really, you, you know, impenetrable for all intents and purposes to antifungals, and, and they really can't be um, eradicated. And, and so Canada auris is also very good at forming biofilms in the uh, external environment. And so on those hospital surfaces, you know, the, the bed rails or, you know, windowsills or thermometers, they form these biofilms, and they're very, very difficult to eradicate. Uh, even with um, with standard um, uh, disinfectants, the the third thing, and you know, the most challenging thing for clinicians is that they tend to be resistant to to antifungals. So the exact antifungal susceptibilities kind of corresponds with the geographic origin of the the clade of Canada auris. You know, those isolates that are linked mostly to South America, for example are more likely to be susceptible to fluconazole. Um, but most of the ones that we see are, are not susceptible to fluconazole, but 90% of them are resistant to fluconazole. And so they also are frequently resistant to higher order azoles, those mold active azoles that we talked about. And then 
of isolates are um, resistant to amphotericin B. And then there are a handful of isolates that have been reported, maybe somewhere between 3 and 5%, that have also been resistant to echinocandins. And in fact, there are some isolates that have been pan resistant. So, of course, that's kind of a nightmarish uh, scenario for uh, clinicians and especially for infection prevention and control uh, professionals. Because if you can imagine that you have a patient who's colonized on their skin, they're shedding it into their environment. Um, they get transferred in um, from another hospital. Maybe they just um, arrived from hospitalization in a foreign country, or you know, they get transferred from a, a skilled nursing facility. They're colonized um, and they you know shed it into their environment. They then get transferred to another facility. Another patient comes into their bed, and you know the, the cycle continues and, and gets amplified. So it is definitely a, a very real concern. Um, numerically, it is not a major risk at the moment, but you know, of course, we're worried in general about antimicrobial resistant organisms. And the CDC has listed Canada auris as um, as being an urgent threat, their their highest threat level among uh, antimicrobial resistance. So, definitely something to keep an eye on if. Uh, any of the listeners uh, come across a case of Canada auris, if their IPC team isn't already uh, aware, they need to be notified immediately. But, uh, you know, hopefully it's it's something that, that can be contained. The The interventions for it are, are basically um, contact precautions. So, you know, patient will be housed in, in, in a private room and uh, managed with uh, standard and, and contact. Um, precautions. Um, we don't have any interventions to to decolonize uh, patients. Uh, they can remain colonized for a really long time, um, you know, over a year in some cases that have been documented. In many cases, they will eventually, you know, stop shedding the the fungus and, and they'll no longer be uh, detectably uh, colonized. And so, you know, hopefully in the meantime, the, you know, number of transfers, the number of room, room shuffles can be minimized and and so the fungus can be contained. That is some nightmare fuel. So I'm glad there was a happy ending to that because <laughs> the, the our, I'll link an article to this from uh, New England Journal of Medicine, but they had like a case report of like ICU spread for it. And it was like through an axillary temp probe, they think. I mean, it was just kind of like, oh, this is like low-key terrifying if this is going to happen. Yeah. And I, I believe that outbreak ended up shutting down their cardiothoracic ICU, which you know, would be obviously devastating to a hospital mm -hmm. and to, you know, all the patients that would be affected mm -hmm. having their, their, you know, heart transplant canceled. Yeah. Or their, oh my gosh. Their, 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 their Canada sure. prosthetic valve endocarditis uh, surgery canceled <laughs> because of that. We have one more uh, case that we want to get to. So just to re to end things on the candidemia, we, we mentioned that we were just going to get blood cultures every one to two days until we're confident that the cultures are cleared. We're going to remove the central venous catheter if they have one. Uh, echocardiogram probably makes sense for most people. Ophthalmology we talked about in most cases, uh, especially if they have visual symptoms, we're going to be getting an ophthalmology consult because that would change the duration of treatment and they might need some of their vitreous fluid removed and an injection of an antifungal, which sounds super cool uh, to, to preserve their vision. And we talked about if they have candida endocarditis, that they'd be on really long six to 12 months treatment just as a starting point. And um, that, that's kind of where we were at with that. Then we started talking about some of the scarier resistant candidas that are out there, Crucii, Glabrata, and Candida auris finally, which is the skin commensal that uh, it seems to be very hard to eradicate and contain. So Beth, let's go on to uh, PJP. Yeah, moving on to a lighter topic from invasive, you know, <laughs> Can't, threat of Canada or just PJP, you know, light and airy. Um, so Christopher is a 73 year old man. He's got a past medical history of giant cell arteritis and he's been on chronic steroids. He's getting admitted to the hospital with acute on chronic respiratory failure. Let's say that maybe we don't have his med list or maybe he's not on anything, you know, besides his steroids. As a spring point from, you know, this guy, who should we be thinking about for PJP and, you know, which, which kind of patients should be worried about this in? You know, PJP classically was uh, described in, in patients with advanced HIV 
And um, you know, when we think about infections that affect patients with advanced HIV, then you know that tells us that the cell mediated immune system is is really important. And so, um, although you know we're seeing less uh, pneumocystis associated with HIV now, we we still see pneumocystis in the context of other you know T cell immunosuppressive therapies. So um, th these would be patients with you know organ transplantation hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, uh, for, for example. Um, steroids are a, a little bit different because, you know, they're less, you know, specific in, in their action. And, you know, this probably comprises the, the, the group of patients that is most numerous. Um, and it's hard to pin down exactly which patients are at risk in terms of you know, what is the dose that is required and, and for how long. But, you know, in general, we think about a daily prednisone equivalent of uh, 20 milligrams per day for at least a month. So in your patient who's got COPD, who you're giving, you know, a pulse of, of steroids and you're tapering it or, or, you know, coming off very quickly after five days, we don't have to worry about, about pneumocystis and we don't need to think about prophylaxis. But, you know, in your patient with GCA, on the other hand, you know, we can anticipate that they're at high doses and, and this is going to be tapered over a very long period of time. So that is someone that, that should, you know, for sure be on, uh, on new assistance prophylaxis. Um, and then, if, you know, of course, uh, patients who are being treated for uh, vasculitis, so whether it's, you know, cyclophosphamide or, or another uh, treatment, and uh, anyone who has previously had uh, new assistance should be on uh, prophylaxis as well. The, the duration of prophylaxis after um, transplantation is, is usually you know, somewhere between six months uh, and a year for most organ transplants other than lung in, in whom you know, frequently we continue these patients on uh, PJP prophylaxis indefinitely. And then in the setting of HIV, it's until they have a CD4 count of, uh, of 200 for at least three months. Um, so those are the patients that, you know, a priori you should have a high suspicion that, you know, they, they could have pneumocystis, particularly if they are not already on prophylaxis. Breakthrough um, infections do occur, but they're very uncommon. They are more common when using, you know, second or third line prophylaxis. So in patients who are not on trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole for one reason or another, maybe it's because of a hypersensitivity reaction, maybe because of hyperkalemia. Um, and so uh, those patients that are on pentamidine um, or uh, etovacone uh, prophylaxis, you know, might be at, at higher risk for, for breakthrough. You know, if you have the right patient protoplasm who, who could be at risk, the, the clinical picture that is compatible with uh, pneumocystis, for one thing, there are some nuances um, that are different between HIV-associated pneumocystis or, or um, PCP and uh, non-HIV-associated disease. So typically, HIV-associated pneumocystis is, is fairly protracted and you know, a, certainly a subacute, if not kind of chronic presentation, patients who've been, you know, breathless on exertion for months. Whereas in patients who don't have HIV, they tend to have more acute manifestations of disease. Um, so, you know, they, they might have been dyspneic for, for only a, a number of days or, or weeks. You know, similarly, the, the progression is a lot faster and the severity is is actually higher among patients who don't have HIV. And often these patients have already been on steroids as we discussed. And so this has implications also in terms of the, the management of whether those patients are gonna benefit from, um, from steroids uh, in addition to um, antifungals. The main thing that is sort of a, a sin quo known of um, pneumocystis is hypoxia. So if a patient is immune compromised and they, you know, maybe they you know, feel breathless, but they're not hypoxic, that dramatically will decrease your, your pretest probability for, uh, for pneumocystis. You know, typically these patients are, you know, profoundly hypoxic, you know, with minimal exertion, um, which is often, you know, 
uh, out of proportion to the radiographic findings uh, or, you know, even the, the other uh, clinical findings. And so, you know, that should be a, a, a suspicion. Often these patients will have a dry cough, um, although the presence of a, a productive cough would not um, exculpate the diagnosis. And so a, an immune compromised patient who's not on prophylaxis, who is um, hypoxic, usually with diffuse bilateral infiltrates, is somebody that you're going to have a, a high pretest probability for pneumocystis. That's really helpful. This is always, you always get a different answer about how much prednisone they have to be on and for how long. But I, I, I like the, you know, t- more than 20, 20 or more for a month. You know, that's that's easy to remember. And if they're on additional immunosuppression, then, you know, it, I imagine that that sounds like that increases the risk, especially if it's cyclophosphamide. So um, definitely can remember all that. How do we diagnose PJP kind of definitively? And, you know, kind of spoiling that question a little bit, I know induced butin with silverstein is useful. H- how helpful are negative tests when we're doing a PJP workup? The, the diagnosis um, definitively requires basically histopathology. But in, in practice, we have a very high comfort with the diagnosis in a BAL that is stain positive. So you mentioned the silver stain. Uh, some places use a, a direct fluorescent antigen um, to visualize pneumocystis. More and more, you know, these type of of, um, of, of tests that require, uh, you know, operator expertise are being phased out, um, you know, which kind of seems to correspond with a outsourcing of um, of investigations to third parties that, that have kind of high throughput, usually of molecular testing. And so what we, what we are left with then is uh, PCR. And PCR has the advantage of its sensitivity. But of course, anytime you increase sensitivity, then the, you know, the, the downside is that you're decreasing specificity. And so the specificity is lower of, uh, of PCR. Um, but again, in the patient that you have a high pretest probability, a positive result is going to move the needle and you're going to be inclined to treat. Um, now, with that said, in a patient who has a very high pretest probability, even with a negative result, uh, with a, a, a BAL testing, you're, you're, you know, probably going to feel, um, obligated to, to treat. But, you know, this would be something that you would certainly want to make a decision in consultation with your infectious diseases and, and respirology colleagues. The question about induced sputum, you know, often we, we can't get um, BEL fluid. Often these patients are too sick also to get induced sputum. And so, you know, there, there have been some um, experimental approaches using things like nasopharyngeal aspirate uh, for uh, PCR, which, you know, looks to be promising, but certainly is not ready for prime time, and it's not done in most labs. This is one of the very few instances where I feel that beta-D-glucan may have a role in a patient who is, you know, hypoxic, you know, you have a high clinical suspicion for pneumocystis, um, and you can order a, a beta-D-glucan, and if it comes back positive, then, you know, you're going to continue the, the, um, the treatment that you've already initiated. Um, whereas if it comes back negative, you might reconsider your your diagnosis. Um, again, because of that, the high sensitivity, but the low specificity of, of beta D glucan lends itself to that use. In, in other circumstances, it's a little bit harder to know what to do with, with um, a beta D glucan result. So, in terms of the management for pneumocystis, um, the first line of therapy is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. It's typically 15 milligrams per kilogram of the the trimethoprim component. Um, Although, you know, there is some compelling evidence that 10 milligrams uh, per kilogram of the trimethoprim component is is probably also effective. uh, Although, you know, that's that hasn't been studied as as rigorously. You know, some of the 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 downsides of uh, of using high dose TMPSMX are you know, hyperkalemia and electrolyte dysfunction. And, um, and certainly it does cause an increase in, in creatinine, although that increase in creatinine usually does not correspond to a, a decreased EGFR. It's 
just that TMPSMX inhibits the secretion of, of creatinine at, at the tubules. And so consequently, you, you measure higher uh, creatinine levels. But that does tend to make you know, intensivists and, and uh, other clinicians a little bit less comfortable, even if the, the ID physician isn't batting an eye. And then, um, you know, as I alluded to before, the other adjunct of um, therapy is corticosteroids. And so this has been validated in clinical trials in the, in the context of HIV. But it is something that we do in patients with non-HIV, uh, but, um, you know, for some of the reasons that I mentioned before, th- there's reasons to think that the pathophysiology might not be uh, exactly the same. And, and the fact that these patients are are uh, typically already on some kind of immunosuppressant suggests that probably adding immunosuppressant isn't going to make as dramatic uh, a difference. And so, uh, again, it is something that, that we do. It's also something that, you know, uh, ID physicians like to pontificate about and, you know, tell their learners that, oh, this is you know, not evidence-based, but, you know, we still, we still go ahead with it as well. Uh, anyway, you know, particularly in the, in the context of, of, uh, you know, moderate or moderately severe disease. All right. So Beth, you feel comfortable now? You feel like, uh, treating PJP now, you got to have a good handle on the, uh, at least the broad strokes of it. I, I'm sure there's more to ask, but I, I think we, we have to let Elon get, get on with his evening at some point. Yes, uh, this was awesome. I mean, I'm still f- scared of fungal infections and in all their forms and wanting to learn more. But I say that as someone who wants to be a future ID fellow. So um, yeah, thank you so much. This was an awesome overview. We appreciate your time so, so much. It, it's a pleasure. I, I'm always happy to talk fungus. Um, and uh, definitely we will put some uh, resources for listeners in the the show notes that I think are are high yield. There's some organizations that are, are doing a great job trying to uh, make high yield uh, educational material for, you know, the diagnosis and management of fungal disease. If you wanted to plug, uh, you know, one of them, that would be now, now's the time you feel free to uh, give, give a shout out. Yeah, sure. So I work with the uh, Mycosis Study Group Education and Research Consortium. And, and so their, uh, their website, um, their educational materials are at Fungus Education Hub dot org. That's funguseducationhub.org. Um, and you'll find all of the, the teaching materials for the mycosis study group. Um, the, the other place that is also uh, published by the, the MSG is um, called Dr. Fungus. So it's uh, Dr. I Fungus. <laughs> yeah. Do- <laughs> Dr. Fungus. We'll punch here. Dot org. Um, and that is also a really good um resource for for uh learners and for uh and for attending physicians uh, for that matter and, and especially for you know these less common weird and wonderful um fungal infections and then the the other resource that I, i'd like to highlight is the uh european confederation of medical mycology ecmm and uh, they have some really helpful uh, tools as well it's uh, ecmm.info um, and they have scorecards for a number of, of common uh, fungal diseases where uh, you can rate compliance according to these kind of best practices. Um, and, you know, for example, the, the scorecard that they have uh, for candidiasis or candidemia, which I should add is um, translated into like 30 different languages, um, has been validated as corresponding to a, a decrease in mortality in uh, adherence to those best practices. So a lot of uh, great organizations doing doing uh, good work to you know, try to um, clarify some of these confusing topics. I, I think Paul and I are going to be joining some of these. Uh, the ECCM is what, whatever the uh, acronym is there, because I, that's the one that gets us to Denmark or Greece, right? One of those places, the, right? The, ES, the ECMM's <laughs> meeting is Tim, uh, Trends in Medical Mycology. That one is in Athens in Oh, yeah. Okay. In, well, in October. Paul and I will be seeing you there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll settle for Athens. That's fine. And I will say, Ilan, I am appalled that you did not mention that we're recording this on the eve of fungal disease awareness week which is actually coming up next week so <laughs> this will be yeah we're recording in advance of it unfortunately this episode will be released after the week has occurred but um yeah i, I think certainly noteworthy and, and deeply exciting <laughs> yeah and you know obviously 
um, the fact that we need a week in order to raise awareness, you know, speaks to the the blind spot that is uh, fungal disease. Um, but the CDC has been doing a great job in, in increasing people's awareness through this this Think Fungus campaign. And so, um, you know, on social media, we'll be we, you know trying to raise awareness and um, and and hopefully, um, you know, people can check out the uh, the, the MSG uh, Twitter uh, account where. Um, will will be a, a landing spot for a lot of this activity. So we'll just be putting this out there, uh, <laughs> yeah. and and uh, we will we will help promote all these things. So, uh, Elon, thank you so much for for hanging out with us, uh, giving us so many great teaching points on fungal infections, which I feel I understand a lot better than I did coming into this. And I know that we like barely scratched the surface, you know, knowing how many how much we left on the table just in the questions that we had uh, were prepared to ask. So uh, probably we'll have to do more future fungal episodes uh, with, with future ID fellow, Dr. Beth Garbatelli as well. So, <laughs> One <thank> day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on this. This is a lot of fun. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a great little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Great. <laughs> great to have you here, Still hungry for more? Join our Patreon and get all of our episodes ad-free, plus twice-monthly bonus episodes at patreon.com slash curbsiders. You can find our show notes at thecurbsiders.com and sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox, including our Curbsiders Digest, which recaps the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news and info notes. And we're committed to high-value practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review on the show on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. You can also send an email to askcurbsiders at gmail.com. Reminder that this and most episodes are available for through VCU at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. So you can go there and claim your CME credit. A special thanks to our writer and producer for this episode, Dr. Beth Garbs Garbatelli, and to our whole Curbsiders team. Our production is done by the team at Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Chris Chu Manchu is the moderator for our Discord. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Wada. I've been Beth Garbs Garbatelli. And as always, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye.